Good evening, everybody, and thank you again for joining us for our journey in the letter of 2 Corinthians. We just kind of got started in our study. Uh, we find ourselves uh, tonight moving into chapter 2 of the book of 2 Corinthians, and we're so thankful that you're joining us in our study here. Uh, my name is Ken Chapman. I'm in Orlando, Florida. Uh, our, my co-teacher here is Jonathan Caldwell in Moody, Alabama. Uh, and we've been enjoying our study together, and I hope that you've been enjoying it uh, as well. Uh, Jonathan, how are you tonight? Are you ready to jump into our text? I am. I'm enjoying this study. First time I've ever studied through 2 Corinthians in depth, uh, and so I'm really enjoying that and looking forward to continuing this with you. Yeah, it's an interesting letter. It's a lot about Paul's own work as, as an evangelist and as an apostle. It's about his relationship to the church at Corinth. And so there's a lot of lessons, a lot of lessons, I think, for preachers, but also lessons in kind of interpersonal relationships between Christians, especially when things are wrong and corrections have to be made. How do we view that uh, on both ends of the spectrum. And so our text for tonight, as we said, kind of transition, it's an awkward transition because it's an awkward chapter break here. Uh, Second Corinthians chapter one, uh, the paragraph begins in verse 23 and then goes into chapter two, verse 11. And so let's just jump right into the text. And we've broken the text into two sections here. Uh, the first one, chapter 1, 23, verse through chapter 2, verse 4. And, and Jonathan, I'll ask you to start us off by reading our text. All right, 2 Corinthians 1, beginning at verse 23. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming to, again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy. For you stand firm in your faith. For I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. For if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? And I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart. And with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Okay, some of the epistles, we think about the two volume epistles that we have in the New Testament. Uh, I would say that First and Second Corinthians kind of stands apart in the sense that they cannot stand alone. You know, sometimes you get 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 1 John, 2 John. You, you know, there, there's some certainly some correlating material in there. But 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians have to be taken together as a package because 2 Corinthians is not just another letter that he wrote to the same church. It is a intentional follow-up to that letter and to the material and the reaction of the material contained in that first letter. And so he writes this first letter, 1 Corinthians, that sets in order and really just kind of goes through page by page, problem after problem that they needed to correct. And it seems that the church at Corinth had a dual response. Some of them, we might even argue the majority of them, took it in the spirit in which it was intended and understood that corrections need to be made and were seeking to make those corrections. But there seemed to be a faction who were offended at that. Uh, and then, as often is the case, uh, rather than attacking the message, they attacked the messenger. And so Paul in 2 Corinthians is dealing uh, with that, with really both aspects, thankful that they had made the corrections, but also dealing with this faction uh, who were offended by that attempt at correction. Uh, and then while we're attacking Paul. And one of the tactics that they used in attacking him is accusing, as Jonathan talked about with us uh, last week, accusing Paul of being duplicitous, of, of being one thing and then another, kind of being two-faced, we would say, uh, in regard to the way he approached them. And even using the fact that Paul had not made a planned visit to them as an accusation, 
And so Paul kind of is setting the record straight. And so he says in strong language, I call God to witness against me. Whether that's an oath or just simply saying, God knows I'm saying the truth here. He uses very strong language in defense of himself in saying, yes, I did not come see you, but here's why. It wasn't because I'm two-faced. It wasn't because I was afraid to be bold in your presence. It's because I wanted to spare you. Uh, it needed some time. And you can think about it. You've had some relationships like that. And it's maybe some conflicts like that where it maybe wasn't best uh, to speak to that person right now. We needed some time and wait and maybe some correction here. And so Paul says, yes, what he talked about earlier, verses 15, 16, and 17. Yes, I didn't come to you, but here's why. It was for your benefit. It was to spare you. Jonathan? I doubt that's what they would have expected to hear. I'm willing to bet that they were expecting some, oh, I got tied up over here. Uh, I got sick or, or something along these lines. And he comes at it really with like this positive negative hit. He's almost playing good cop and bad cop at the same time. Uh, as he says, it was really to spare you, uh, which means that he might have knocked some heads together, but also because he, you know, because he does love them. Uh, he, he does want what's best for them. And so I doubt that's what they expected to hear. And so he, you know, he has a good platform to work from here as he maybe catches them off guard a little bit. Yeah, and, and I think this is an answer to verse 17. He had asked the question in verse 17 of chapter one, was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? Now, that may have been some of the accusations that were being hurled at Paul. Uh, and so he asked that question in verse 17, was I were there negative reasons why I didn't do that? And then he answers his own question by saying, no, here's why I didn't do that. It was to spare you. And he said, it was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth, not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in the faith. I take that to mean, at least in part, of Paul saying, okay, I wrote that letter, that harsh letter, 1 Corinthians, and now it was really the best approach was to wait and see if you would make those corrections yourself, rather than me writing that letter and then following that up with an immediate in-person visit to, as Jonathan said, knock some heads together and fix, it was best for you to fix it. I did what I did by inspiration. And so now rather than lording it over your faith and coming in there and forcing you to make these corrections, it was best to wait and let you read the letter, absorb the letter, work at making these corrections on your own, because here is the goal. The goal was we work with you for your joy, for you stand firm in your faith. Uh, that was the purpose of that letter. That was the purpose for any visit. And even Paul says for a non-visit is so that you might stand firm in your faith. Now, we're going to step out of, of uh, the box a little bit as we go through here, because much of this, I think, is, is great lessons for preachers. And here's a lesson for a preacher, for an elder, for anyone who's serving Lord's people, is here's the motivation. Here's why we should be doing what we're doing. Uh, and Paul says, here's why I did this. Here's why I did that. Here's why I didn't do that. It was for your joy that you might stand firm in their faith. There's kind of a gut check for those of us uh, who are preaching, serving as elders or whatever, make sure that's your motivation for everything you do and even for the things you might not do, uh, that it might be good for people's faith. Jonathan, you have anything to add? I do. Uh, you know, Paul tells Timothy uh, in the first part of the epistle to him that the aim of our call is love. Uh, and, and so kind of gets at that at the heart of that uh, as well. But then I was, I'm also thinking the, the way you worded it uh, struck me that Paul's going to step back and let them work at it. It always means more when you have to do it yourself. 
uh, when you have to work through the difficulties as opposed to mom or dad or, or somebody coming in and, and taking care of it, uh, you, you know, uh, in, in paying off debt. It means more when you've hunkered down and uh, done all this extra work to, to pay it off as opposed to, you know, someone writing you a check and saying, here you go. Uh, and, and so Paul is going to let them work with that a little bit. By the way, if anybody wants to do that, feel free. Uh, we'll give it a shot and see if it means anything. Um, but but I but I, I I like the way you said that, and it makes sense what Paul is doing. Let them work it out themselves and see if it doesn't mean more when they come out the other side uh, as they work through all of this together. It's almost unavoidable in, in this letter in these sections to. Uh, keep from making that parent child analogy like mm -hmm. you did there, Jonathan, because that's kind of the relationship here. And, and that's a good point. I could picture a parent and, and, and maybe if, if I'm honest, this was me sometimes giving my kids instructions here, how you need to do it. Here's how you need to do it. And then about three seconds later, me going, ah, oh, just let me do it here, you, you know, getting frustrated. And Paul is saying, I didn't want to do that. Right. I gave you the instructions. It was time to step back and, and let you, correct those things and maybe step back and see if you were going to correct those things. And so he says, for I made up my mind again, this was intentional on my part. It wasn't because I'm two faced because I'm vacillating because I'm weak. I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. Now there's a lot of debate about this, another painful visit. And you might go back to our first video in this series or Jonathan went through that Corinthian correspondence. And uh, many people think that there was a trip uh, between uh, the Acts 18 trip where the church was established uh, and the book of 2 Corinthians that Paul made another physical trip there uh, that was called the painful visit. And that's possible. And I don't have a problem with that. The book of Acts doesn't record that, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. But there's another way, I think, to interpret or to translate this verse. Uh, it could be translated this way, and the grammar allows for this. It says, for I made up my mind not to make another visit to you, which would be painful. In other words, there wasn't a painful visit. There wasn't a visit at all. That's his point. And so I didn't want to come to you under these negative circumstances. Again, I wanted to wait and see if you would work these things out. And then when I came to you, it would be a pleasant visit rather than a painful one. And so I think that's uh, maybe the, the idea of what he is saying here. Although we cannot rule out another visit that was painful uh, in there. But it seems to me that if Paul had made a physical trip to Corinth that could be termed as a painful visit, that that kind of destroys the argument that some were making that he's weak in the flesh and he's weak in person. Well, if he had that painful visit, that why were they saying that? And so it seems to me that this is the best way maybe to translate or to, to interpret this particular sentence. I, I would agree with that as well. When, when Luke changes into um, the travel diary, really the itineraries, he gets pretty specific uh, with his stops, even if he's just barely there. Uh, and, and so while I'm not claiming that the Holy Spirit had to, to do something specific and mentioning something, it seems like with the relationship with the Corinthians that he would have mentioned that. Uh, and, and so I think this maybe deals away with having to make that assumption uh, that, that Paul made that quick, you know, jut across the sea uh, typically we argue from Ephesus, uh, and then back real quick. Uh, and as you said, I hadn't even considered the, the idea, their accusation that he's weak in person. Uh, obviously if it was a painful visit, uh, he hadn't been pretty weak. Uh, the implication is that he, that he, you know, would have ruffled some feathers. Yeah. It seems to me the best way to reconcile the content of, of the rest of the letter, really. So he says, for if I cause you pain, uh, and so a visit, if I make a visit now or before sending this letter and getting the report back from Titus, it would have been a painful visit. That first letter, 1 Corinthians, was a painful letter, I believe he's talking about. 
But he says, if I cause you pain, who is there to make me glad but the one whom I have pained? Uh, and so sometimes the truth will be painful. Uh, and so sometimes there is some discipline that's involved, some hard messages. And again, here's a message for the evangelist out there. Sometimes we have to present a painful truth. It's not fun, and it shouldn't be fun. If it ever gets fun, maybe you need to change career paths, but it's never fun to kind of correct people and, and discuss a painful subject where, where correction needs to be made, but it needs to be done. And it's for the purpose, as Paul has pointed out here, is so that they might be joy in the end. Uh, and so Paul is not, he's saying, I'm not weak. I've caused that pain, but I would much rather to be made glad and for your joy to be experienced. And so now he's going to talk about his writings, he talks about a visit. Now he talks about his writings that caused pain. And he says, and I wrote as I did so that when I came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice, for I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote to you out of much affliction and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. Now, there's a lot in there, but let's start with this writing. What is this talking about? And again, in that Corinthian correspondence list, some would argue that there was a letter between 1st and 2nd Corinthians that's known as this uh, painful letter uh, or this letter with many tears. I don't see any reason to argue that this isn't the book of 1st Corinthians. I think it checks all the boxes of 1st Corinthians. Number one, I wrote to you, we know Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians, uh, that there was pain, there was anguish of heart, and with many tears. Uh, all I would, my argument would be is go back and read 1 Corinthians and see if that's not descriptive of that letter. Uh, the correction that was there. Paul's language, again, later in the book of 2 Corinthians, is going to let us know that, again, Paul didn't relish the idea of getting on to them. Uh, it hurt, and he knew it was going to hurt, and, and I can see Paul writing the book of 1 Corinthians with anguish of heart and with many tears. That doesn't seem like a stretch to me, and so I don't see, again, any reason. Again, I don't have a problem with there being a letter out there that we don't have, but I don't see any reason to assume that this is not 1 Corinthians, and how could you not say that 1 Corinthians was painful, that it was with anguish of heart, affliction, and many tears? It seems like to me it checks every one of those boxes. Jonathan? There, there's some argument, um, and I don't want to open too big a a can of worms here that uh first corinthians 10 through 13 or second corinthians 10 through 13 is a separate letter uh and some have argued that maybe this is what he's referencing here and we'll see that when we finish up second corinthians 9 and move into the next section that paul changes tones uh and, and so maybe there is some uh, uh validity to that view however uh, there, there's no textual evidence of that. Uh, it's not like uh, 2 Corinthians 10 to 13 has been floating around by itself uh, in the manuscripts or anything. This is just people trying to piece together uh, what, what's happening here. And as you've clearly stated, I see no reason to think of this as anything other than 1 Corinthians as he berates them and, and rebukes them and corrects them. And that could not have been an easy letter for him to write, for them to receive. Uh, and, and so I see no reason to, to see that as anything other than 1 Corinthians. Yeah, I think sometimes we try, we make things much harder than they need to be. Uh, just take things at, at face value. The most obvious answer is usually the answer. Uh, and that change of tone later in 2 Corinthians, that's not... I would argue not unusual for Paul's writings. Paul's letter, many of his epistles kind of make an abrupt change, maybe not a change of tone, but a change of topic that just abruptly from one chapter to another. Uh, and as he changes subjects or changes view, it might change tone. 
Um, and we also need to think that these don't need to think that these letters were necessarily written in one setting. Uh, he may have written that first section, walked away, came back and said, okay, now I need to address this next section. And the tone would have changed as, as it was appropriate. But what's interesting here is the, the almost the contradiction. It's not really a contradiction, but uh, the idea of the anguish of heart, affliction and tears. And all of that was so that he might feel joy. Uh, and again, you think of the parent-child relationship. Uh, of a parent disciplining their children. And, uh, you know, the old ad is this hurts me more than it does you. I don't know that I buy that. I've been on both ends of a spanking and, and it hurt a lot more to get one than it did to give one. But, but I know the meaning of that, that any true loving parent doesn't enjoy inflicting punishment on their children. And then it's hard, but the whole purpose of that was so that joy might be, so that you might have this good, obedient child who would grow up to be a good, respectful Christian adult. And so that results in joy. And so the whole purpose of that, it was necessary so that joy and faith might abound uh, in their relationship, not just to Paul, but to Jesus Christ. All right, that moves us to our next section, and, and that's 2 Corinthians 2 verses 5 through 11. And Jonathan, if you can read that for us. Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. Okay, the first question that pops into this section is, who is this anyone? If anyone has caused pain, and that he has caused it to all of you, who is that anyone? Now, the two most uh, frequent answers that are given to that is the anyone is the uh, fornicator, the offender in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And you might pause the video now and go back and read 1 Corinthians 5, that first few verses at least, where Paul gives them instructions uh, of, of the discipline that they are to enact among that one who had his father's wife. The other common response that is given to who this anyone who's caused pain is, is maybe one of the, uh, of the faction there at Corinth who were criticizing Paul uh, as, as a messenger. Uh, it seems to me that the, the, the needle leans toward the first choice, that this is the man of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. If it's one of Paul's accusers, he seems to be saying, okay, y'all have corrected that, let up on him. But now later in the book, Paul's going to be talking about that. And so that, it seems to me that doesn't really fit as much as it might fit uh, the, uh, the uh, offender of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And so in the first letter, they had been proud. There was inaction in regard to this uh, fornicator. He tells them what to do to correct the situation, deliver him to Satan that the spirit might be saved. And so it appears, if our interpretation of this section is correct, they had done that, and he had made amends or attempted to make amends to, to repent of that sin. And so now Paul is saying, the discipline worked, now accept him back. And so he says he has caused pain, but he's caused it to all of you. Now that language there might make us uh, lead us to the conclusion that the members at Corinth were afraid to accept him back, fearing Paul's reaction. <laughs> no, well, yeah, we'd like to let you back, but man, Paul got us told last time, and we don't want to be on Paul's bad side, uh, and, and so because of Paul, we don't want to let you back, and Paul is saying, no, wait a minute. First of all, he's caused the pain to you, uh, not directly to me, and your punishment has been severe. It's worked. And so now you need to turn and forgive and comfort him. 
Uh, and there's so many lessons. There's a whole sermon here, isn't there, in church discipline and the purpose of church discipline. And, and again, I see this mirrored in the parent-child relationship. You may have to sternly discipline your child, and particularly if they're a younger child, this might be harder to see in the teenage years, but in a younger child, you discipline them harder, and, and they may run off in a huff crying but they're going to come back and crawl up in your lap and, and, and want to, to make amends. And Paul is saying, accept them back. Uh, the re relationship can be repaired because of this. He's caused this pain, but the whole purpose of that was not to just drive him away. The purpose was that the spirit might be saved. And so he says, I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. Uh, it seems to me that it matches perfectly with the situation in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And so again, he says, this is why I wrote, why I wrote 1 Corinthians. And I might should have just put chapter 5 here. This is why I wrote that section, to see whether you'd be obedient uh, to anyone. And I think this uh, language kind of mirrors 1 Corinthians as well. When he says, anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Forgive. And so don't be withholding fellowship from this man because you fear my reaction. If you forgive him, I will forgive him. Now compare that with the language in 1 Corinthians 5 when he was telling them to correct this person. He says, when you're assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present, you're delivered this man into Satan. And so when you do that action, I'm with you. When you discipline this guy, when you withdraw your fellowship from him, treat him in that kind of harsh way, I'm with you in that. And so now, when you welcome him back, love him and forgive him, I'm with you in that as well. There's, the, there's the heartache and the tears. Uh, that, that is not something that Paul, the Corinthians, or we should do with any kind of uh, lightheartedness. Uh, that, that is a, almost a last ditch effort uh, to, to save a soul here and, and to deliver someone to Satan is, is a heartache. It is a, uh, a heart rending thing. It's nothing that we enjoy or want to do. And so I think you can even tie this back into uh, how he wrote to them with much heartache and tears uh, in, in that letter. Yeah, I think if, if you can say that Paul could write that section in 1 Corinthians 5 of scolding the church, of saying, deliver this person uh, to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, and that Paul could write that without anguish, heartache, and tears, he needed to turn in his apostle card. Yeah. And, and, and the lesson again for us, if you're an elder, if you're a preacher, if you can do that without there being some anguish and tears, you need to turn in your preacher card or your elder card because the attitude should be that this hurts to be able to do that, to, to enact this discipline. But what you do, I'm there with you and the discipline end and on the reconciliation end. And so uh, to me, uh, there's many reasons why we can attach this to that section. And so why we need to do that, why we deliver them to Satan, why we welcome him back is... <clears throat> so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his designs. And so Satan can use even a good thing, a God-approved thing like church discipline. God, Satan can use that to harm people, to harm that brother who's been corrected and now wants to come back and make things right, to harm the relationship between those brethren, to divide a church. Uh, and we probably all could speak of instances where Satan has done that. He's used something good uh, and used it as a source of division and a source of harm. And we need to always uh, be on the watch. You know, a lot of times when we think about being watchful for the roaring lion, we're thinking about like for drinking, for drugs, sexual immorality, those what we might call personal sins. But we also need to be on the watch for how he might be working within the church of causing division and harm and hurt and driving a wedge between brethren and, and destroying souls by destroying an entire church. We don't need to be ignorant of his group designs as well. 
you could probably argue that he's already mentioned one of those things in this text when he talks about that excessive sorrow. Uh, or or have, have, you don't want to push this man to despair, uh, to do maybe even depression, uh, or to the sorrow that he's going to talk about over in chapter seven, uh, that worldly sorrow. So, so yeah, I, I like this warning here that Satan can take even a good thing and, and use it against us. Yeah, again, I think about the warnings of, of parental discipline. You remember the language of Paul right. in telling fathers uh, the language there to, to not frustrate your children in that regard, in, in regard to discipline, I think. Uh, and, and that's the warning here. Uh, that Satan can use those tactics and, and uh, the discipline was for a purpose. It's achieved that purpose. Let's not let it drive. So we need to enact discipline, but we need to be very careful and loving when we do that. In fact, every time, whether it's parental discipline our church discipline, we need to pause and say, am I doing this in love? All right, that's our text uh, for tonight. We hope that you've uh, enjoyed our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. Uh, we will look forward to seeing you next Monday night when we'll pick up right there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12, and Jonathan will guide us through that study, and we'll see you next Monday night at 6.30. Thanks again.